don't feed them after midnight. Hey everybody, Adam Savage here at Prop Store with Brandon Allinger and a gremlin. Yes, so yeah, well, a mogwai, a mogwai. This is Gizmo. Gizmo. He is, this is a, a original Gizmo from two? From the second film. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So this is a puppet that Rick Baker and his team built. Of course, Chris Wallis designed Gizmo for the first Gremlins film, and then Rick Baker took over for number two. This is a Baker Gizmo. It is amazing, and I, this gives some idea of what goes on behind the scenes. All of these cables, probably 30 cables, all coming down to a group of servos, high powered, lower powered, plus probably a control box for all of this, plus two hand actuators. And all that was required to get Gizmo going. Yeah, yeah, pretty serious work that's gone into this. And of course, this is just one version of the puppet. They do all kinds of different versions. I think they had six or seven different key types of Gizmo puppets for all the different shots that they would have to achieve, right? Right, so you might see him waving and that's one puppet. Right. You might see him grabbing something, that's another puppet. You might yeah. see him eating and that's a third puppet altogether. Yeah, yeah, but I think this is a hero version with a lot of functionality in the face specifically. Yeah. The faces I know because we handled some of them before, they did this, this replacement face thing where they would have different mouth expressions. Oh. And so the head remains, but there's little snaps underneath there. I won't try to take it off yeah. now, but you know, you could change them out for like a sad face or whatever it might be. That is um, really cool. Yeah, kind of like, you know, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, Jack Skellington replacement face animation or right. something like that. Right. But I love the detail. I mean, look at the eyes on this thing. How yeah, the, the, the fantastic they are. Back painted onto uh, hemispheres. It's mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. really gorgeous. Yeah. Plus false eyelash. I mean, I know that Rick loves high quality hair work. Uh, and just, you can see every hair on the chin has been right. hand punched. punched in. Yeah, yeah, totally. And and this is an amazing condition, you know, they had these storage boxes built for these puppets. And I know this one was in Rick's shop in a storage box for many years. And when we pulled it out and uh, looked at it, cause I, I was around and handled this one about 12 years ago when it got sold to a collector for the first time. Yeah. They were about as fresh as the day they're made. And I think the Tom Spina team has again done a sealant treatment on this, but other than that, it's unrestored and original. And Just to stabilize it. Yeah, really held up well. So I wanna give you a, a kind of a mental view of what's going on inside here. For each of these actuators, for let's say the eyes, there's like two aluminum uh, half circles that are attached to some actuator movement that can move. Then the eyes can probably go up and down. That's two, two other cables. The mouth has both movement and and expression, the head can move, the ears can move, the hands and the arms probably can move. Um, we'll get a shot later, but you can see this just like tranche of cables coming out his ankles. And all of these things have to be machined so that they fit inside a sculpt that someone's doing that's getting molded separately in the shop. And this is one of the things that Rick Baker's shop did at such a high level, was marry these different creative teams of the machine and the mechanics and the computer control with the sculpture and the hair work and the fine painting. Yes, yeah, yeah. And, and all that stuff moved so far in the 1980s, you know, what, what they could do with animatronic puppets specifically. And it's like at the start of that decade, it was in one place, it was very homemade and old fashioned. And they really got pretty precise with the computer controlled cables or yeah. you know, servo controlled cables. Um, and, and I love seeing all this stuff. You know, you could, you could argue that you want to display just the puppet but I would never detach it from all these cables and mechanisms. And for me, all this really adds to the story of what the piece is as a whole, you know? Completely. I'm also, I mean, I think this, I, I have a, I, it feels like this was built for display. Like it was, uh, sorry, the, the, the stand here was built specifically to display the workmanship. Probably, the yeah, cable yeah, control. yeah, I think that's right. And you, you also, you can see these little metal plates back there, which probably designed to be bolted to the floor of a set. Right, right, right. To hold here, it in I'm gonna position. spin this around so Josh can see. Um, Right, yeah, so you see these metal plates with tapped holes so they could screw them up from underneath, and that's holding on to all of those cables so that they can route up through his little legs. Oh my gosh. And the hair work is, I, uh, up close it just feels like you're looking at an animal, you know? Yeah, and, and the design does change a little bit between film one and film two, just like the gremlins. Yeah. When, you know, if you look at them casually, they're the same thing, but if you really study them side by side, it's definitely an update, yeah, um, yeah. which I think is what Rick wanted to do with it, you know? He is really, really magnificent. And I mean, the ears are even translucent. You can kind of see uh, through yeah, them, so you can they're, see they're the, thin enough. the yeah. veins there yeah. of like, Whoops, there yeah, you go. Oh, yeah, yeah, look at that. It's a good way to illustrate oh, and it. And the vein isn't even just painted. It's actually almost like, it's almost like it's, 
embedded, I wonder. Cast into it? That's, I find myself wondering that huh. because it's way more pronounced with the light than it is in the paint job. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That would be some serious effort they've gone through there, <laughs> cast veins into the ears. I remember at one point showing Rick Baker a picture of, uh, of a piece and he was like, oh, it looks really good. The hair work could be better. <laughs> like it was so clear, he's like always thinking about the hair work. And again, he's just like the little ones on his chinny chin chin. <gasps> he's still soft. Yes, yeah. Just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, again, stored very well and preserved very well. And that's the thing with foam latex. There's no question it's delicate, but if it's stored properly, it can hold up very well, you know? Amazing. This is, I, there were a lot of gremlins built across the movies. Where yes. does this place in the pantheon of like the quality? This has got to be way up. Oh, I think to the top. this was one of the very nicest gizmos that they had. Yeah, and I mean, I think uh, have you ever seen the famous photo where they literally got out everything they built for that film and put it on the floor of Rick's shop? And I it's have. just it's just it, overwhelming. It's like hundreds of it's puppets. upsetting. Yeah, it's, it's tens of thousands of person hours of right. hard work. Uh, yeah, unbelievable amount of work. Yeah, um, but I think you know when when we first got to know Rick 10, 12, 15 years ago, whatever it was. There's, he probably had sort of six-ish gizmos that were around at the time. So not a huge number, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and whether one or two had gone elsewhere in the past, I don't know. But um, obviously, he's kind of the star of the show and really an icon of the 1980s, you yeah. know? It's like if you talk about 80s movies, gizmo really represents it. 100%. I want to do a call out for how beautiful the little dirty fingernails are mm. on, and the toenails. This is the kind of stuff that like, you know, as they're wrapping up or getting close to the end, they're still paying attention to every little detail. Yeah, yeah. And even though it's tiny, they've got to pack a huge amount of that life into it, right? Yeah. I mean, because also it, it might even be that you build this and bring it to the director and the director's like, everything is great, but somehow I need Gizmo to be another 10 feet farther from your control surface and you're gonna to have to extend all these right, cables. And right. That's real, like right. that totally happened. Yeah. And would be very upsetting on the day if you weren't prepared for it, right? I must admit to you, when we first came, when I first came in and saw this, I was really hoping that it was set up so we could actually puppeteer it a little bit. If it, you know what, if it was, if it was 1990 and they just made the <laughs> film and it was fresh and supple, maybe we'd do that. But I think now it's just the risk of something going wrong would, it would scare me. I, me too. Yeah. I, yeah. I bet I had this picture of like you make him smile and then his face just, just falls cracks. to dust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Last story before we wrap, I was on uh, at ILM when they were working on the re, uh, remaster of E.T. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, they called it Boy's Life internally, so it didn't okay. sound like yeah. we were working on E.T. And uh, the E.T. animatronic puppet came into the shop one day for some close-up shots. And it was just after hours on a Friday, and we all pulled out the remote control and we puppeted ET for a couple of hours. That's cool. <laughs> Good selfies, right? It was. ET no, selfies. we didn't have we wow. didn't have digital cameras back then. <laughs> Nobody had digital cameras. Film selfie. Yeah. <laughs> Get out your Nikon. <laughs> Brandon, this is such a great piece. Uh, and the auction's in June, yes? Yes, June. Yeah, it's coming up. Uh, over eighteen hundred items. This is just one of many great pieces in there. God, he's so gorgeous. All right. See you guys next time.